Mr. Singh, and ladies and gentlemen, we thank you very much for inviting us here this evening and giving us an opportunity to address all of you on the subject of science and religion. As Mr. Singh has very ably put it, there appears to be some conflict between science and religion. However, it is the purpose of the Bhaktivedanta Institute to demonstrate that really there is no such conflict. Uh, if persons think that there is a conflict between science and religion, it means that either they do not know what science is or they do not know what religion is because the two cannot be contradictory by the very nature of their definition. What is science and what is religion? Science means a system of uh, information, experimentation by which certain facts can be established uh, as irrevocable truths. And in fact, religion means the same thing. Sometimes in Sanskrit we hear the word dharma for religion. Now in Sanskrit this word dharma, the word dharma, the root of the word, means that characteristic which cannot be separated from a thing. For example, when we try to understand the character of sugar, it is its sweetness. When we try to understand the characteristic of fire, it is its heat and light. It cannot be separated, the characteristic, from the object which it is part of. So when we talk about Dharma, or an individual person's characteristic nature which is intrinsic to him, then we have to understand this principle by a scientific method. In other words, real religion is only possible by a scientific approach. Now, if we study the nature of science, which, as Mr. Singh has pointed out, has achieved many wonderful accomplishments in the modern world. There is a tendency to be overconfident in regard to what science can achieve or accomplish. In other words, this building that we are sitting in today is the result of a certain amount of scientific knowledge. There's an architect who calculated the stress on the various columns and was able to design a building of such proportions. There are various elements which went into the formation of the structure of this building which are able to fulfill their particular function. The glass which can be uh, seen through, the steel which supports the structure, the wood which makes up some portions of the building, the fans which create wind flow and give us some soothing relief. Each one of these has its nature and has been properly understood by a scientific brain. And this is a very simple structure when we compare it say with a jumbo jet, a 747, which is very sophisticated so that can lift 500 people in the air and practically take them from one destination to another destination thousands of miles away without any difficulty. Undoubtedly, science has achieved wonders. But that should not mean necessarily that science has the answer to all questions. It would be a wrong conclusion to say that 
uh, because science has accomplished a certain set of goals that they're therefore capable of accomplishing all goals or for that matter that because science has properly understood how to construct this building that they also have understood how the universe is constructed so this kind of uh, logic is a fallacious logic but unfortunately the tendency nowadays is that because of the success of modern science people are ready to conclude that whatever science says even when it sometimes is not proven by experimentation must be accepted now one of the reasons why we have respect for science is that it establishes ahead of time a principle, a hypothesis you can say a guess, there is a, a guess based on good reason and logic and after making such a hypothesis, a guess science tells us a certain experiment which can be performed to establish this guess as a fact and if anyone performs the experiment under the given conditions then they should be able to also observe this fact as a truth this is the basis of science basically it comes down to this principle of hypothesis and then experimentation and then ultimately establishing a particular truth now the fact of the matter is that there are many scientific hypotheses or many guesses which have not yet been established as truth one of which Mr. Singh mentioned Darwin's theory not yet a fact after 100 years still it is called Darwin's theory because there are many interesting loopholes in Darwin's theory of course the most famous being the missing link because Darwin's theory basically states that Ah. beginning with a very simple celled creature life has evolved up to the point of the human organism that means simple one celled living entities have gradually evolved into far more sophisticated ones to this day there has never been any established proof of a particular organism producing a completely different species or organism it still remains a theory no doubt it is an interesting theory but it remains a theory and according to science unless it can be established by experimentation it can't be accepted yet as a proof and yet we find that it is commonly accepted amongst most educated people that man comes from the monkey and the monkey comes from a lower creature and ultimately that the origin of everything is some chemicals as Mr. Singh very nicely put it by combining chemicals together life is created now this may sound very nice but a very simple statement should be made at this point if someone claims that life comes from chemicals then as we have clearly indicated in the back of this book which we are going to be presenting each one of you a free copy of life comes from life that if you say that life can be made from chemicals then we challenge everyone and anyone that beginning with the chemicals you put them together and create some life a simple life form say a blade of grass or as it mentions in this book the egg of a chicken now a chicken's egg is a very simple thing it has a I mean we you are a farmer Mr. Singh so you know that the chickens are producing eggs daily and they're not very big scientists you see? but they're able to produce an egg now what is an egg after all it has a hard calcified covering a shell inside there is the softer white portion and inside that the yolk and this is simple farmers 
description of a chicken's egg. From a scientific point of view, they know every single part of the chicken's egg chemically. So taking the various chemicals, why not produce a chicken's egg? That is not very difficult because chickens are doing it daily. <laughs> so the reason that it is not possible is that there is a part of the formula which the scientists are missing. And that important part is especially understood through this process of religion. Now you may say, well then this is the problem. You are speaking about the Atma or the soul. And as soon as you mention the soul, it is something which is so etheric or non-substantial, non-material, that it defies the proof of science. And therefore there's a conflict. Because you are speaking about something which is not material and science is the realm of that which is material. So the two can never meet. Now we beg to differ with those who make this assumption. Because there is a science by which the soul can be proven. And that science I will now explain to you. Again, let us look at what it means to be scientific. There must be a theory, a hypothesis, a logical explanation. There must be an experiment which can establish under certain set conditions that the theory is true. And anyone who is a scientist following the conditions of the experiment should be able to prove the theory true. Now, there is a spiritual science which fulfills all of these various aspects. And that is called Bhakti Yoga. Now when you hear the word Bhakti, you may think, oh, you mean that type of devotion which is full of emotion. Yes, I have heard of Bhakti, but of all the types of yoga, that seems to me to be the least scientific. At least you could have mentioned some of the other yoga systems. Just like Kapila Dev's system of yoga in which he describes all the 24 elements of the material world. And then the final transcendental element. You could have mentioned that. You could have spoken of Raja Yoga. You could have spoken about so many others. Why Bhakti? Now, first of all, we must clear up a misconception that you may be having. That bhakti is simply the interest of those who are overly emotional. For your information, bhakti has always been studied by extremely learned and scientific persons as the most comprehensive system of yoga. Because in the school of bhakti, there are great teachers who have made extremely scientific explanations or theories about the process of creation, the existence of the soul, and even the existence of the creator. Amongst the school teachers of bhakti, you will find very, very exalted and learned persons. So bhakti does include a comprehensive theory. The theory begins or it has been explicitly stated in the famous book known as Bhagavad Gita. In the Bhagavad Gita you will find some very scientific explanations about the existence of what is called an anti-material particle, the soul. You see the soul is not material, it is anti-material. It's qualities are quite different than material nature. Material nature is described as being endlessly mutable or changing. Although the material energy is always existing, it changes its shape or form. On the other hand, the anti-material energy does not change its shape or form. It is not subject to any kind of material condition. For example, as the Bhagavad Gita explains, it cannot be cut, it cannot be burned, it cannot be withered, it cannot be made wet in any way. 
it is not subject to the conditions of material energy. Now there are two types of energy that we're talking about. The material and the anti-material. This world that we are living in is a combination of these two. The material energy and the individual anti-material souls or atmas. And these two are interacting under the influence of a third element, the time factor. The time factor in which we experience past, present and future. So all activities which we call karma are the creations of the anti-material souls interacting with the material energy under the influence of time. Now, according to the theory, you can say theory because it is actually it is established, we will establish it as more than a theory, but at this time we say according to the theory, this anti-material particle is the real source of the life symptoms within the body. What are these life symptoms? Birth, growth, maturation, reproduction, dwindling, and ultimately death. These are the changes under which a body passes when we say that the body is alive. Any living entity must be seen to have these different changes or going through these different changes for it to be considered a live creature. Now what is the source of that life? If it is material chemicals alone, then science should be able to create a very simple living entity, as I said, a simple blade of grass or a chicken's egg, but they cannot do that because it is understood from the theory of Bhagavad Gita that life does not come from chemicals but life begins as soon as the soul is present within the body. In the human form, let us take the human body. When the father and mother conceive a child the anti-material particle, the soul, is impregnated through the sperm of the man into the womb of the woman. And at that time the egg becomes fertilized because of the presence of the soul. There are many sperms which enter, but not any one of them will impregnate the egg. But when the sperm with the soul is impregnated, that particular egg becomes fertilized and will grow gradually in the womb of the woman. Without the presence of the soul, there can be no growth or maturation or ultimately birth or any of the other symptoms that we see of life. When a body is dead, all of the various aspects of the body are present, but why is there no life in the body? What is the real explanation for death? You can say that some aspect of the body has become malfunctioning. Maybe the heart has stopped its function. That is a medical explanation. But the fact of the matter is that at a certain point, the soul leaves the body. The anti-material particle separates itself from the material body. That is why when the relatives are crowded around a person who has died, they say, he is gone. He is gone, but he is laying right there. If he is the body, then why do they say he is gone? because there is something within him that has gone. In the Bhagavad Gita, there's a very nice explanation that just as a person changes clothing, so we are changing bodies. Just as a man changes homes, moving from one home to another, so we are changing bodies. And what changes the body? That is the soul. According to Bhagavad Gita, there are eight separated material elements which constitute this body and they are very broad categories. Earth, water, fire, air and ether. These five make up the gross body. The subtle body is made of mind, intelligence and ego. This is the subtle body. And the soul is a completely anti-material particle separate from these eight. When a man dies, what happens? According to the theory of the Gita, 
The gross body is given up. But the subtle body made of mind, intelligence and ego do not die. And it is this subtle body that carries the soul into its next birth. By what means? By consciousness. Now you may say, how do we know that this soul exists? Because it is anti-material, we cannot see it. On what grounds are you establishing the existence of the soul? We can give a very simple example. This afternoon, the sun was shining. Had we been sitting in this hall, having this meeting in the afternoon, we might not have seen the sun directly. How would we have known that the sun was actually shining? What would have been the proof of it if we could not have gone outside? Can anyone say? The light, the sunlight. Simply by the sunlight we would know that there must be a sun shining outside. Although we do not directly perceive it, we know it by its symptom. Now, consciousness is a symptom of the soul. Although we cannot see con the soul with our material eyes because it is not material, we can perceive its existence by consciousness. Material chemicals do not produce consciousness. And then no scientist will ever state that they do. Simply combining material chemicals cannot create consciousness. Just like a computer. A computer is made of so many material elements. But it has no power to think on its own. It requires a living person to program it. We have to recognize that chemicals, inert material elements, in their own cannot produce conscious thought. Consciousness is a symptom of the soul. Now, according to the Gita, any living being that has consciousness must have a spirit soul or an anti-material soul. That means not only humans, but all species of life are possessed of a soul. Now you may say, and Mr. Singh said at the beginning of his introduction, that we see that humans are distinguished from the other species by their superior intellect. Unfortunately, most people misunderstand intellect to be a symptom or proof that there's a soul. And unless there's a human intellect, they conclude there is no soul. That is why in many religions you will find that they think the soul is only in human beings, not in others. But they have made a basic mistake. It is not that the lower species have no intelligence. Just like if anyone has gone fishing. You know, when you try to fish, you put the hook in and there's some bait on the end of the hook. I have never seen a fish who tries to get the hook. They always try to get the bait without the hook. Isn't it? They try to get whatever you're holding up there without getting caught. This is intelligence. It may not be very advanced intelligence enough to build a house, but it's at least enough to stay alive. I mean, birds are very intelligent. Have you ever seen them fly in formation? They can outdo any Air Force. You know, they'll fly in perfect formation, zigzagging all around, doing many sophisticated things that no airplanes can do. And have you ever heard of two birds colli colli colliding in the midair? We have never heard of that. Neither we have ever heard of two birds who, neither we have ever heard of two planes that can produce a third plane by, you know, combining together like two birds can do. So, we should understand this is intelligence on the part of the birds. It may not be the intelligence that we have, but that doesn't mean that there's no intelligence. There is consciousness, there is intelligence, but it is covered. A good example, let us go back to the example of the sun and the light. When the, supposing that these glasses were all tinted different colors, one glass was tinted dark blue, another glass was tinted red, another glass was tinted yellow, and perhaps one other glass was clear. Now the sunlight outside is of the same magnitude, but the light that comes through the glass is different according to the tint 
on the pane of glass. So we don't see equal light coming through, although outside the light is equal. This example can give us some understanding of how consciousness differs according to each species. The soul is equally powerful in each and every living form. But according to the body that covers the soul, it is like different colors of the glass. In some, the consciousness shines stronger than in others. Therefore, we can see the soul's original consciousness more clearly in the human than we can in, say, an animal or a bird. Which means that humans have a specific facility and even a specific responsibility, which others don't. It is only in the human form of life that they can inquire into the nature of existence. And this is the real proof of a human being, that he wants to know why. Who am I? Where have I come from? What is my goal in life? Now science, because of its tendency to become bogged down in material technique and manipulation, most scientists are not inquiring on these ultimate conclusions. Most scientists are not philosophers, they are technicians. And there is a vast difference between being a technician and being a true scientist. A technician simply manipulates the material energy to produce some wonderful result. But a real scientist is a philosopher and he wants to get to the origin of everything. Now, as Mr. Singh pointed out, there are some very interesting speculations about the origin of life. For example, the Big Bang. The Big Bang is now the number one theory of how everything started. And we would like to explode this Big Bang theory. They say it happened by explosion, we want to explode the theory. With again a very simple example an ordinary wristwatch. How many pieces would you say make up this watch? Perhaps 200, 100, I'm not a watchmaker, but maybe 100 to 200 pieces. I doubt that, at least in my watch, it's not a very costly one. I did probably use less than 100 pieces. Let us say we take this 100 piece watch and we will shake it, you see? shake it up very nicely in our hands and then throw the pieces in the air. Please tell me what is the chance that all the pieces will come back exactly together and form a working wristwatch. Only a hundred pieces have to come together. Does anybody think there's any chance it will happen? It, I, let, well, supposing we let the pieces sit on the ground for a few years. Maybe after a period of time, it would happen. What do you think? We could give it a million or two billion years. Maybe then it would happen. But I think it will never happen. It can never happen. And yet, this is only 100 pieces. What does it require for the chance to take place of the chemicals which originally formed this universe to just come together in the proper proportions to form even simple creatures which are much, much more complicated. This watch came together because there was an intelligent being who made the watch. There was a living intelligence that put these pieces together. And to assume that there is no living intelligence that gave this universe a start is sheer foolishness. It is, and, and worse than foolishness, we have to use the word enviousness. To, be, to say someone is foolish is not as true as to say that that person is envious. Because he cannot recognize that there is a superior intelligence. Why? Because he thinks that he is the most superior intelligence. The number one problem with man today is that he thinks that he is the greatest gift to the universe. You see? And that there can be no more superior being than him. Although somehow or other he has not managed 
this world very excellently. Although he's so superior in his intelligence, he cannot give peace to the world, he cannot eliminate the most common problems of life, like old age. And of course, when you say this, science answers, just coming, you know, it's just around the corner. Although that is another nonsense proposal, that one day old age will be solved. Our spiritual master, who formed the Bhaktivedanta Institute, his name was A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the author of this book that we'll be giving you tonight. His very simple point is that, uh, that you should understand that it is not possible for life to come from matter. But life has to come from an intelligent source, another living being. And you may not be able to understand that intelligent being, but there is a science by which you can understand him. So this gets us back to the point we we're making. What is science? Theory is there. The theory of bhakti, yoga, is elaborate. The Bhagavad Gita is only one book. It is the introductory book to Veda. Veda means Vedanta. Vedanta means the end of all knowledge. The Vedas are encyclopedic books containing information on all scientific knowledge, on all branches of science. There are parts of the Vedas dealing with medicine. There are parts of the Vedas dealing with warfare. There are parts of the Vedas dealing with farming. Every aspect of existence is covered in this Vedic knowledge. And the Vedas that are present on this planet are very small compared to the Vedas present on other places. So, Bhagavad Gita and Vedic literature are elaborate theories on the science of bhakti. Now, next, what is the experiment? In order to establish that bhakti or devotion it is scientific, what is the experiment? The experiment is the process which has been explained by the Vedic literature and the process is called devotional service. Now, let me explain. In order to be able to scientifically experience the existence of the soul, as I have given you some logical understandings about consciousness proving the existence of the soul, but as in order to get first-hand experience of the existence of the soul and first-hand existence of that supreme intelligent being who is the source of all souls and the source of the universe, there is a process by which you can see both. And that is called bhakti. The process begins by purification of consciousness. At present, we do not possess the, the sufficient intelligence and elevated purified consciousness to perceive these two. Just like some hundreds of years ago, Western science had no understanding about the existence of the atom. Of course, the Vedas even have the word atom. The very word is in the Vedic literature. And you'll be surprised to know that the whole theory of relativity was already explained in the Vedic literature. How atoms combine together to form molecules, how to judge the time it takes for two atoms to come together. It's very elaborate explanations are there in the Vedic literatures. That's why the Germans studied the Vedas for creating the atomic bomb. The Germans are very big Vedic scholars, Sanskritists in Germany who thoroughly studied the Vedas in getting help in creating the atom bomb before this, in the second, during the Second World War. Now, the problem is that for science, most scientists say that we will experiment on a guinea pig, but we will not be the guinea pig ourselves. Whereas in bhakti yoga, you have to be both the experimenter and the ex experimented upon, the guinea pig. You have to at the same time be writing down the observable facts of the experiment and performing the experiment on yourself. Now you may say, that is very subjective. I may lose my objective appreciation 
and I may be, you know, too much in favor of this thing because of not being detached enough. In this regard, you have two checks. One, the Vedic literatures. Two, other scientists. Because the Vedas are full of examples of other scientists who have done the same experiment. As well, there are many other scientists who you have to associate with who are also performing the experiment. So their detailed notes will give you an objectivity. And it will not be simply a subjective experiment. Now there are conditions under which the experiment has to be performed. Again, the scientists may hesitate and say, you know, well, they shouldn't hesitate because every scientific experiment, if there's a theory, you have the right to state your conditions. So we say that the experiment is that you have to purify your consciousness. At the present time, the consciousness is not clear. In its original form, consciousness is pure. Just as the rain falling from the sky is actually distilled water. But as soon as the rain touches the earth, and gets through the atmosphere, it becomes mixed with so many other, you can say, impurities. In the same way, the spirit soul, the anti-material soul, in its original form, the consciousness of the soul has no impurities. But as soon as the soul enters within the material body, the consciousness of the soul becomes mixed or pure, impure. So in order to understand the pure existence of the soul and the supreme soul, the supreme intelligent being, you have to free the consciousness of impurities. The process for freeing the consciousness differs according to the age. Now we are living in an age known as Kali Yuga. According to the Vedas, the ages are going in cycles of four and they repeat. The Kali Yuga lasts for 432,000 years. The Dwarpa Yuga lasts for double that, 864,000 years. The Treta Yuga is double that, and Satya Yuga is again double that. So the fourth Yuga, the last of the four, is this Kali Yuga. In the first Yuga and then the other Yugas, the method of purifying the consciousness is changing according to the time. Because just as the yuga is longer, so people's lifespan was also longer previously. The fact of the matter is that it was recorded historically that people were living much longer, even 100, 200 years ago. Everyone may know their great, great grandfather, they lived 80, 90 years was not so unusual. Now it is very unusual. Now you may say, but we have heard that the life Duration is increasing. Yes, it is increasing because there are certain things that make it increase. Number one, the elimination of child death. Death at the time of birth, death of young children. By medical improvements, that does not take place very much. So the overall life duration increases based on averages. But individually, people are not living longer. It is obvious. It is obvious as the world becomes more and more contaminated. The water is contaminated, the air is contaminated, the earth itself is full of so many chemicals and contamination. How can you possibly think that a human being can live longer with the amount of stress that a person has to undergo? People's life is not longer. that You live 70, 80 years and you're lucky. People were living much longer in the past. And in the previous yuga, they were living still longer. According to Vedas, the duration of life in Kali Yuga is maximum 100 years. But in the Dwarpa Yuga, it was 1,000 years. And there's an interesting statement in another religious scripture, the Bible. In the Bible, there is a character, Methuselah, who lived over 900 years. Why? Because of the previous yuga, the previous age. In the Treta Yuga, they lived 10,000 years. And in Satya Yuga, they lived 100,000 years. Now everyone studies Ramayana. Who is the author of Ra Ramayana? Original author is Valmiki. So, Valmiki was practicing yoga. And others at the time were practicing yoga. And their yoga was very long. Who is that sage practicing 60,000 years? Huh? Where's our scholars, Vedic scholars? One sage was practicing yoga 60,000 years. 
Therefore, the method of purification at that time cannot be the same as this time, now, when we cannot even live a hundred years. So the Vedas state that if the consciousness is to be purified in this age, there must be a very powerful, effective method. What is that method? It is the method by which we are known. It is our trademark. Namely, the Hare Krishna mantra. Now you may say, oh, well, we know about Hare Krishna, but we didn't know there's anything scientific about it. Yes. The word mantra, what does it mean? Man means mind. Tra means to purify. This sound vibration is so powerful that the effect is to purify consciousness. When one repeatedly pronounces the mantra, the result will be all impurities will come free from the consciousness. What is the proof? The scientists who have tried it. Now you may say, I doubt it. You have a right to doubt it as a scientist. But you cannot maintain your doubt unless you perform the experiment and it doesn't work. If you are an ex-scientist, then you must perform the experiment and see if it works or not. Now there are various conditions under which the mantra is effective. Just like in every scientific experiment, there are certain conditions that you have to maintain as constants. So there are constant conditions under which the effect of the mantra will act. What are those conditions? Again, they're going to sound very, you know, very basic. Or you may say, I can't do them. But forget about whether you can do them or not and just hear what they are. Consciousness can only be purified when you remove those activities which are causing the consciousness to become contaminated. Now what are the most, what are the basic material activities which cause the pollution of consciousness? The first one is meat eating. Now you may say, I can't see the connection. You should see the connection because in practically every religion of the world, every single scripture demands that meat eating is not at all beneficial for spiritual advancement. Perhaps it is not given scientific explanations. And because we are living in the age of science, we need scientific explanations. Fair enough, we will give you some scientific explanations. Let us talk about the process of meat eating. First of all, let us look at the human organism. The human organism, beginning with the teeth, which are the first thing to contact the meat, is a flat, the teeth are all flat. Now in animals which are meat eaters, we see carnivorous animals have sharp teeth. There are no animals with teeth that are flat that eat meat. They do not do this. Only man does this. Which proves what a big animal he really is. <laughs> he does what no other animal does. Once you get beyond the teeth, you have the next problem, the saliva. Because the saliva that is produced in the human mouth is quite different than the saliva produced in the mouth of animals that eat meat. It does not contain sufficient enzymes to break down, to start to mix with the meat, which will help in the digestion of the meat. But there's a much bigger problem. And the bigger problem comes in the intestines. The intestinal tract of a human being is more than 20 foot long. But in the animals that eat meat, their intestines are very short because the meat must pass out very quickly. Otherwise, when meat sits for a certain amount of time, it starts to rot. It becomes toxic or poisonous. And the result is that it gives off these poisons which create so many secondary diseases. Now, of course, in the West, it is a common knowledge that eating meat is being linked to cancer. Of course, there's nothing new about that in Vedic literature. It was already known. So there are enough reasons to be given medically, even economically. We can give you economic reasons why it is uneconomical to use the land for producing food which will feed the animals which you want to eat. Because the same land can produce this, this, more food to feed humans if they eat the food directly 
as it is grown than if you eat the meat which was fed on the food that you grew. Economically, it is uneconomical to eat meat. The price of meat is very expensive anyway. There are many, many points to be made. So I was only trying to tell you what the conditions are for the experiment of bhakti yoga to be effective. The experiment of chanting the mantra. If you want it to be effective, you have to purify the body. If you constantly put impure things in the body, then George Bernard Shaw should be quoted. The famous playwright. He said, you are what you eat. If you're constantly going to put impure things in, you cannot ex expect something pure to come out. Is it? it won't be like that. So meat eating has to be abandoned if you want to perform the experiment and get results. The next thing is illicit sexual activity. Why? Because the illicit sex not only creates different types of diseases which we are now seeing. The number one disease, killer disease, AIDS due to illicit sex. And there are so many other problems and there are so many problems which we can you know, explain on the basis of what happens with illicit sex just like how many abortions are being committed now. Now abortion means you abort the life which is within the womb. As soon as the, as the sperm fertilizes the egg, the soul is already there, the life is already begun. So this murder which is going on in the name of abortion has got reactions. That is called the law of karma. Law of karma means action and reaction. In the law of physics, physics, science of physics also studies action and reaction. Every action has its consequent reaction. The law of karma only teaches that. Every action has its reaction. The only difference is that in the law of karma the reaction may come over many births, many lifetimes. Not just necessarily over one. That is why when someone is born blind or someone is born lame, it is not the work of chance or bad luck or genes. Genes are just a scientific convenience for explaining the law of karma. Really what is happening is that something has been done in the previous lifetime to warrant the reaction of blindness or lameness. Because there's ultimate responsibility. Nothing goes unnoticed by the supreme intelligent being. We have to recognize that when the soul leaves the body at the time of death, it is carried by the subtle body. The mind, intelligence and ego do not die. When the gross body dies, the subtle body carries on and the desires which are in the subtle body carry the spiritual particle, the soul, into its next birth. Consciousness is not destroyed because consciousness is a product of the soul, not matter. The material body may die, but consciousness was not dependent on the material body. It was dependent on the soul. And it is in consciousness that the thoughts and desires are sitting. And these thoughts and desires determine our next birth. Just as your thoughts and desires made you come into this hall tonight. Thoughts and desires determine future actions. So this is the second thing, illicit sex, which contaminates the body and worse still, the mind. Because the, as, as we said that meat contaminates the physical body, illicit sex life contaminates the mind. And the mind is very close to the seat of consciousness. So one who is disturbed by illicit sex cannot chant the scientific mantra properly. He will not chant the mantra correctly and he will not be able to get the effects of the chanting. Then what is the next condition? The next condition is the giving up of all intoxicants because this is another detriment. Intoxication. Why? Because intoxication numbs the intelligence and mind. And if a scientist is to be very sharp and to understand the effect of the mantra and to feel the effect and perceive the effect, then he can't be dull in his brain. Now you may say, well, I'll get drunk one night and I won't do the experiment, but when my head clears, then I will do it. But it doesn't work like that. Consciousness doesn't clear up so easily, you see. 
Although your hangover may go away by the next afternoon, the consciousness has been imprinted, affected, and it takes much, much more work to get over the, the effect on the consciousness than simply the headache that you get from drinking. So these are three things. And last comes unnecessary types of gambling, which doesn't only mean betting. It also means speculating. Gambling may also be a mental gamble, which is speculating, guessing wildly on so many things, speculating. For some time while one is chanting the mantra, one has to get over the speculative mood and follow the discipline which is enjoined within this scientific experiment. As long as you perform this experiment, you have to put aside different speculative philosophies and ideas. Now you have the right to record everything. You have the right to discuss with others. The result will be, if you perform the experiment of chanting the mantra, that all impurities will come out of the consciousness and gradually you will perceive the self within. You will become what we call self-realized, atma gyan, scientific knowledge of the soul. And as you continue the mantra, again and again, maintaining the set conditions, the next realization will come of the Supreme Soul, Param Atma. These two Atmas, the individual Atma and the Paramatma, will both be realized by the scientific investigator who practices Bhakti. And what will be the result? The result will be the thing which all science is ultimately trying to achieve, a perfect state of happiness for the individual. The individual who realizes his self as being completely separate from the body and who realizes the Supreme Self, the spiritual personality and intelligent being who is responsible for the whole process of existence, that individual becomes supremely happy. At the end of life, one who has achieved this realization, his soul does not have to take another material birth. But that soul immediately returns beyond this material universe to the anti-material universe, which is known as Vaikuntha, that place which has no anxiety, wherein there is no need of sunshine, moonshine, electricity, where there is no birth, death, because there is no time factor. And living in that spiritual abode, the individual anti-material particle, the soul, gets a spiritual form which is not subject to old age, which is not subject to disease, which is not subject to death, and lives in that eternal spiritual fo form in complete state of knowledge and bliss. So I have tried to state tonight that the process of bhakti yoga is a scientific process. It has theory, it has procedure, there are conditions, and ultimately there are proofs. Anyone sitting here can get the result of this scientific experiment if they are willing to be a real scientist. So we have stated from the beginning that there is no conflict between real science and religion. The problem is that under the name and banner of science, there are so many unscientific, unsupported statements being made. And because of the success achieved in material productivity and material progress, by the scientists, people are willing to accept everything and anything as a scientific conclusion without demanding experimentation. Now we demand of Darwin and we demand of the explosive theorists and the cosmic soup theorists that they substantiate their theories by scientific experiment. If they can't, then we cannot give any credence to what they state. We are making a scientific statement that the soul exists, that there is a supreme soul, and that you can perceive your own soul and the existence of the supreme soul, and that you can actually go beyond this material universe, travel back to the spiritual universe from which we are originally coming, and achieve an eternal life. And all of this can be proven by experiment. This is our statement. This is our challenge to any scientist in the world. That if they doubt it, then let them make this experiment. Then only will we accept it if they say, we don't believe you. Until that time that they're ready to perform this experiment, no one can disprove this theory.
So we stop here and we'll take some questions now. Let's have some discussion from anyone on the points which we have made tonight. Fortune of the present educational system is that basically people are supporting the scientific view that there is no soul and that God does not exist. Although neither of them can be scientifically established, the children today are being educated in this way, with the result that people who are godless are also becoming highly immoral. And the problem today is that immorality is increasing year by year because of atheism. And atheism is being supported on the basis of it being scientific, when in fact it is the biggest theory of all. So it's very practical. Teachers have to think very, very carefully about supporting atheistic teaching when they teach their students. Because the result will be that children will come up, be brought up immorally. And immorality gives rise to a very unfortunate circumstance. When one is immoral, he commits sinful acts. And sinful acts are the cause of repeated suffering. And this is the idea behind karma. We are suffering on account of the past sins. Sins come from ignorance. When you don't realize that you will suffer for improper action, you commit so many improper actions and you have to be punished for them. So it's very regrettable when in education we cannot train the students to properly understand scientifically the existence of the soul, the existence of the supreme soul, and the process of devotional service. That is why we want to give all of you this book tonight and there are other magazines and books that we will also like you to see in the back at our book table. You are all members of the educational field. If you can please study these books carefully, then you can present scientifically the conclusions of the Vedic literatures without sounding superstitious or sentimental. Any questions? Yes. Maybe you can. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just referring to the problems that the youth are having these days. And I request uh, to throw some light. I uh, recommend what is the right way that we can guide the youth, driftness away from religion, so that they attain education at the same time follow the religion and be the best citizens. Mm. We have to understand that if the youth are becoming misled, the fault lies in the teachers. Sorry to say, no one should take offense. Because how can we blame the youth? We have to blame the parents and the teachers who are raising the youth. The real problem is ignorance. To teach means, to give knowledge means to destroy ignorance. Ignorance is the basic cause of wrong action. A child puts its hand in the fire. Why? Because of ignorance. Ignorance is no excuse. The child will be burned. If the child is educated, then the child will not put its hand in the fire. If we see that young people are being misled and performing wrong actions, the cause is ignorance. They have to be educated. Now what is the beginning of education? Real knowledge means not only to understand matter, but also to understand anti-matter or spirit. Full knowledge means an education in material subjects as well as spiritual ones. If I go to your schools, I would like to know if you have a department teaching the scientific basis of the soul. There are so many departments teaching all the different aspects of this body. Is there one department of knowledge about the soul? I doubt it. Because it's considered the realm of religion and not science. Therefore, we have written books like this. Now we suggest that the best thing for the teachers is to get copies of this book. We're prepared to supply you these books to give to your students so that they can have scientific knowledge. If they do, they're going to understand a very basic fact. That every time I am suffering, 
It is due to my past action. When I get a bellyache, it's clear what the cause is. I ate too much. That's an immediate karmic reaction. But it's not so clear when the action and the reaction is separated by many years. What to speak of lifetimes. Now supposing a small baby gets burned in a fire. It cannot remember what gave him the scar. But the parents can tell him, you fell in the fire. In the same way, we may not remember what we did in a previous lifetime, which is giving us our present karma. But from knowledge of the authorities like Bhagavad Gita, we can learn everything about the past. One who is a scientist, a spiritual scientist, by studying a person's life at present, he can understand a man's past as well as future. So we can tell people how to get free from suffering if they learn to for, follow clearly the laws of nature. Just as when you live in the world, if you break the laws of the government, you're punished. In the same way, if you break nature's laws, you must be punished. There are physical, mental, and spiritual punishments that come. So our recommendation is educate the youth properly. And we are writing textbooks on this subject. It is not that there is no knowledge to give them. There are ample now. We will give you one book tonight, a simple book that could be presented to every single student in Fiji. And it would clear up so many misconceptions. Another question? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, very nice question. I will repeat uh, this lady's question. She has said that if the soul is indestructible, then why is there a population explosion? Each time a person dies, there should only be, again, the same number of souls being constant. The answer is very simple. The number of souls is constant, but the number of souls in the human body is not constant. I will give you a good example that everyone here can understand. When someone fails to graduate from their particular level, at least I am uh, from uh, the United States, they are made to repeat again another time. I don't know what the system is here, but if they are doing very poorly, they are forced to repeat again. Now while they are repeating, there are more students coming up from the lower grades joining them. So suddenly if there are many people repeating and others are coming up, the number in that class starts to increase. The number of souls that are leaving certain animal forms are becoming human. The number of humans are not graduating. They are not going back to the spiritual universe. But they are repeating again as humans and the souls in the animal bodies are graduating into human bodies. Therefore, we see an explosion of the human beings. Population explosion. This is the idea. This, Darwin was almost right. He was nearly right. The species are actually, as he saw them, they are more evolved. Each species is more evolved than the next. What he did not realize is that it's not one species evolving to the next. It is the soul going, the consciousness of the soul evolving to the next higher, the next higher, the next higher. Because he was an atheist, he could not understand the existence of the anti-material soul. That the soul was evolving from the lower species to the next higher species and finally the soul was getting a human form. It is not that matter evolves, it is consciousness that evolves. Darwin was almost right. One gentleman had a question. Yes. Guruji, it is quite clear that if I do a thing, I have to fight for it. But is it true that uh, we have also had to fight for our ancestors who have done the sins? Do we have to fight for that too? Uh, to some extent, yes. Just like supposing 
Supposing a man dies in debt. Hmm? Supposing there's a, a company and the man dies in debt. Then the sons who will take up the company, they have to pay the debt. According to Vedas, you have to clear the debt of your past forefathers. Now you may say, how is it fair? I'll tell you how. Because your father and mother, they gave you so much positive help. And their father and mother gave them so much help. So ultimately you are benefited by all of your previous ancestors. But you may also be hurt by them, by their wrong actions. Now this should not make you too worried. Because there is a way to clear away all debts. I will quote from Gita, Sanskrit. Sarva dharmam paditya ja mam ekam sananam braja aham tvam sarva papyo muksha syami masucha Just completely surrender unto me, the Supreme Lord says, and I will give you protection from all sinful actions. Do not fear. Another verse. Devarshi, uh, what is that? Devarshi, I'll look it up. Uh, one verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Very nice. This is very pro appropriate statement which will help you to understand. Just patience for a second. Here it is. You listen to this statement and it will be very clear to you. Here. Devarshi Bhutapna Ninam Pitranam Nakin Karo Rayam Ri Charajan Sarvatmanaya Saranam Saranyam Gatomu Kantam Parivitya Kartam Anyone who has taken shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, Mukunda, the giver of liberation, giving up all kinds of obligations and has taken to the path of, in all seriousness, he owes neither any duties nor obligations to the demigods, sages, general living entities, family members, humankind or forefathers. In other words, if you perform pure devotional service to the Lord, then He frees you from all the responsibilities to the forefathers. Just as by pouring water on the root of the tree, all the leaves and branches get fed the water. Similarly, by giving your service to the root of all existence, God, then all of those connected with God that means everyone is automatically fed. So although you do suffer, there's a way out of it. That's the point. All is not hopeless. Another question. Here. Yes, please. First one is karma. Okay, Look, may I answer that question, then you can ask your second question. Uh, so far, whether karma is fair or not, we have to understand that the cause of what you're speaking about is ignorance, that people may be ignorant and not know about karma, about what they have done wrong. But I tried to explain this simple point to you. That our, let, let us use the example of a prisoner in the prison house. Now, when a man does something wrong, he's put in prison. That prison is meant to teach him to follow properly the laws of government so he can get free. This material world, this material body and life are like a prison. We have broken nature's laws. Nature means God's nature. We have broken the laws of God and we are now suffering in the shackles of material existence. The purpose of the suffering is not just to give punishment. The government maintains the prison house at great expense to reform the prisoners. So first point you must understand 
The purpose of suffering from karma is ultimately meant to teach us that material existence is never pleasurable, that it will always cause suffering, and we should get we should learn what the proper laws of the government are and get out of the prison house, become a free soul again. Now, if you committed some sinful activities in the past, it is your own doing that you are in ignorance. What is the cause? Why don't you go all the way back? Why does the soul come in the material world to begin with? Is it the fault of God? Or is it the fault of the individual soul? Our cause of coming in this material world was our own choice. We are created with the free will, independence, to choose whether to stay in the kingdom of God or come within this world. It is we who made the choice, the wrong choice, to come here. Having made that choice, we are now engaged in so many different actions for which we are enjoying or suffering. We cannot say that there is no fairness in it that I'm being punished for what I have done in the past. You may remember or not remember, but the law acts. Supposing someone does, supposing someone kills someone, and then he can't remember it. What happens? Does it mean that he's no longer guilty of the offense? Is forgetfulness or remembrance the proof of whether one should be punished or not? Can you remember if you were in, when, what it was like to be in your mother's womb? Nobody can remember that. But it's a fact that we were in our mother's womb. In the same way, it is a fact that we have done so many things in the past life, good and bad. Now we have to accept that whatever I am enjoying or suffering now is the result of that. And at least I should decide now, from now on, no more sinful activity. I don't want to suffer anymore. Is that... Okay, second question. There's a vast difference between going to the moon and creating life. The two are not dissimilar. In other words, going to the moon is all that it means is extending the principle of travel. That's all it means, that you're extending the principle of traveling. As far as the Vedas go, they already discussed traveling to other planets even without spacecraft. The yogis in past were able to travel to all the planets without the use of any spacecraft. So traveling to the moon is nothing new, first of all. It's not wonderful. Second thing is after going to the moon, what was the gain? Let's be very intelligent now. Instead of being impressed by the scientists going to the moon, please tell me what was accomplished in going to the moon. Have you found your life in Fiji improved? Have you found your life in Fiji any improved from there going to the moon? Has anybody's life been improved? What is the, what is the result of the moon travel? Did that cost billions and trillions of dollars? What was brought back from the moon? You remember? Dust. Rocks. Now, just tr try to see my point. If they went to the moon, I say I would have been impressed if they had gone to the moon and brought back something that would have benefited men. But what have they benefited men by it? Just like if you go to Fiji, and you come back, supposing a man goes from New York to Fiji, and back, you see, he stays there for two or three days, and then they ask him, what did you do? And he said, here's what I did, I brought some rocks. <laughs> it, it doesn't mean anything. Then even he went to Fiji, you feel it is useless, your trip. So I say that the moon trip is useless, because what was beneficial? Simply bringing back rocks after trillions of dollars are spent, that is foolishness. They should have brought back the cure to cancer. They should have brought back something valuable. But to bring back rocks, 
that doesn't make sense. And another question I have is this. Why is it they have abandoned going to the moon? Now they said they went to the moon. Why is it that we don't hear anything more about going to the moon? Why is it that you don't read anything about going to the moon now? If it was so important to go to the moon, then why is it that there's not, no follow-up at all? I mean, these are practical, I'm giving you practical points. Instead of giving scientific, just any simple man on the street can give these points. Why is it that with so much, you know, uh, uh, pop, pop, propaganda and publicity for the success of the moon flight, why is it we hear nothing about it anymore? But I mean, that makes me very suspicious. For either I'm suspicious that they ever went, or else I'm disgusted that they spoiled so much money. One or the other. And with me, it's both. I'm doubtful that they went, because I think anyone that went would not have abandoned this idea so quickly. And if you say, well, we all saw it, and I watched it on television in America, but I have already seen wonderful science fiction movies that make everything look perfectly real. I'm not impressed. And I'm not convinced. And they took a survey in America, and it, it, one third of the U.S. people who were polled thought that they didn't go to the moon. So they're not, and not everybody believes that. Not everybody accepts Darwin's theory either. I think there's a lot of bluffing going on in the name of science, to be honest. Because, you see, you, if you want to believe someone, you have to see the nature of the man. If the man's personal conduct and behavior is not very upstanding, then the chances are that he may lie sometimes. And, and that goes on all the time. I'm not impressed by most scientists. I'm impressed by scientists who are also scientific in the way they live, not just in the way they think. Because if someone lives scientifically, that means lives purely, lives honestly, lives truthfully, then I believe in his thoughts also. I don't disconnect a man's lifestyle from the way he thinks. So, I, I'm not impressed by this idea about the moon. It's not, neither I find any benefit from it, the main point is that, I find no benefit has come. Simply to say we went to the moon, that doesn't impress me. Yes, yes sir. Uh -huh. Yeah, because the factor of is there the factor is disintegration. Everything gradually diminishes. The nature of the body, the nature of matter, the nature of material existence is that it's gradually wearing down. So the yugas gradually become shorter and shorter by this process of wearing down, just like the human body gradually wears away. In the same way, material existence gradually reduces until gradually it's a person, in the end of Kali Yuga, a man will live to 30 years and will be considered old man. A person will be three foot in height and will be considered tall. These things are mentioned in Vedic literature. Everything is diminishing. Just like during the time of Krishna and Arjuna, it is said that they were 16 foot tall. This is called Chatri Katri Hall. Hall. So the, the Chatriyas at that time were 16 foot high. And we can't imagine that. They were so powerful. We cannot imagine. That's why when we read Vedic literature and it says that someone had the power of 10,000 elephants, we cannot understand how it's possible. But you have to understand who these persons were and what was the powers that existed at that time. This is Kali, and in any case, although Kali Yuga is very short, and a man's duration of life is very short, there is one advantage. That simply by chanting the mantra, 
हरि कृष्ण हरि कृष्ण 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 हरि 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 राम हरि राम 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 हरि हरि ऑल द डिसएडवांटेजेस ऑफ कला योग आर काउंटर एक्टेड आई थिंक आई विल कंक्लूड नाउ बाय मेकिंग आवर एक्सपेरिमेंट वी कैन ऑल मेक द एक्सपेरिमेंट सिंस नाउ एवरीबॉडी इज अ साइंटिस्ट हियर वी विल ऑल डू अ लिटिल चैंटिंग इवन दो यू मे नॉट बी फॉलोइंग ऑल द कंडीशंस दैट आई मेंशनड अर्लियर still you can try the experiment do we have the mantra written anywhere no anyway i think may, ma, many of you may know the hari krishna mantra does that anyone know it raise your hand i uh, i will chant it you can repeat after me hari krishna hari krishna hari krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 hare hare now i will chant and you can respond you try to pick it up i will first say the whole mantra then you can repeat hare krishna hare krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Now you chant Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Now you can Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Ram Ram Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare So this is very simple chanting mantra that anyone can uh, experiment with we recommend the best time for chanting is in the morning time when the mind is very peaceful when there are less uh, external disturbances uh and we also would recommend to uh visit our center to get further knowledge about this science of bhakti yoga Uh, we have so many books our founder shila prabhupad wrote more than 100 books on this subject believe it or not he did it all within about 10 years time so these books you can see some of them on the table 
and be sure that every one of you gets a free copy of our book. If you want to introduce some of these books in your schools, they are not sectarian. We are not a sect of Hinduism, although you may think that is the way it is. It is not. The word Hinduism does not appear in the Vedas. It is a word which came about in very recent times to describe people who lived on the side of the Sindhu River. They were called Hindus. There is no mention of the word Hinduism in any Vedic literature. It does not exist. We are teaching eternal principles of spiritual life. It can be followed by any person of any religious denomination. It is totally non-sectarian. I don't consider myself a Hindu priest or a Hindu teacher. I am a teacher of the science of bhakti yoga. That is not a sectarian system meant only for a certain group of people. So you don't have to be afraid that in introducing these books, you're introducing some particular sect, religious faith in a certain system. No, it is not like that. So my request is that you please study this book. I think that you will derive a lot of insight. It is a very nice book. And I request you that after reading this book, get some more books. So I want to thank everybody. What is, what do you want to speak? I want to thank everybody very much for uh, listening attentively. I will again turn the program over to our Master of Ceremonies. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.